Okay, if you would take a look at your syllabus as we get started today. Um, there's one error that was found by a studious student today uh, in the syllabus. It says by error that the next test is only chapters 17 and 18. It's actually 17 through 19. And there's a typo kind of in two places. It mentions heart, blood, and blood vessels as the topics. But those are spread over three chapters, not two, OK? So where it says test number five is 17 and 18, it should be 17, 18, and 19. The vocabulary is correct in that it's, what, 71 through 90. And here's the reality, though. Um, this test is coming fast, right? It's next Wednesday. And I sent out an email, did all un understand what I was saying, and that in the summer, I lose instructional time. They give me the same exact number of minutes in the fall or winter semester as they do in the summer, which is why my lectures are not one hour and 25 minutes, but two hours and 10 minutes. That extra time is to make up for the two shorter weeks that we don't have together. But every time we have a test, I'm losing 40 minutes, right? Because I'm giving you the entire two hours and 10 minutes to the test rather than an hour and a half. So I'm losing 40 minutes every time we have a test. We have six tests in the semester. That's a lot of time. So the only way I can make that up is to give you a couple of lectures online. So I gave you one on blood, OK? It's online. If there's, if there's time, I'll go back and hit some highlights. But I want you to be independently ready to go for that lecture. And that's posted for you. That's blood. I'll start with heart today. And I'll move into blood vessels. And then if there's time, I'll go back and look at heart, OK? So I, I don't want to leave that hanging, but I wanted to make sure I got through all of the major details for this exam. Also, that means I need to give you 10 vocab terms today and then 10 vocab terms on Monday to get us through those 20 terms. So we'll go 71 through 80 today, 81 through 90 on Monday. Um, this next test is exclusively on the cardiovascular system. We've been dealing with that in lab. We've been talking about the heart, the flow of blood through the heart. We've talked about blood and blood typing. We've talked about blood vessels today and Monday. So there's nothing that I'm going to say here that is weirdly unfamiliar. Okay, There's not a whole new, brand new material or content that's going to come your way over the next few lectures. Hopefully, what you'll be doing is sitting back and saying, OK, got this. I've already been quizzed on this. I'm good on that. Oh, OK, there's a new connection that I need to make. So hopefully you're kicking back and you're feeling comfortable. This won't be quite as brutal as the spinal cord, right, where everything's brand new and you've never seen it before. So that's my hope. Uh, this exam five usually goes quite well for people. It is not as long as the last exam. Exam four is the, it is the, the barn burner for the semester. So that is the long exam. I always give one long, super long exam. And I do it for many, many reasons. One, the nervous system is complex and there was a lot of content to cover. But number two, I think it's really important. I heard Joshua, you talk about it. You know, staying in your place and taking a test for two hours is a new phenomenon for many of you, right? That sustained concentration is something you have to build up toward. And all of you, unfortunately, tests are with us for the rest of our life. So it doesn't matter if you're going to go to a four-year school, if you're going to go to graduate school and take the GRE or the MCAT or whatever tests, you know, the NCLEX, whatever it is, the NCLEX for nursing is now approaching six hours, right? People can take six hours on that exam, and you get a break every once in a while, but it's a long exam. You've got to be able to focus and concentrate for that entire period of time. So not only am I teaching you anatomy, I'm hoping that I'm also teaching you a little bit about just sustaining yourself, pacing yourself, doing a test. There won't always be time to go back and look at every single question. Now, I could give you that same test, and I assure you, especially with the the generous gift that I kind of added on, uh, part of it on purpose, part of it, oops, I made a mistake, I'll give the gift to you. That extra point sort of negated for that long, long test, right? It did kind of uh, make it OK. I could have asked you, I could have given you the same test with 50 questions on it. You would have walked out of here in a half hour or an hour, done. The grade wouldn't have changed. I mean, your overall understanding of the content would not have changed if I'd asked you just 50 questions or 180 questions how well you understood it would have reflected the same. Um, the only difference is your mental, you know, um, your mental ability to stay with me for two hours wouldn't have been challenged. So hold on with me. Hold on. I appreciate it's a long test, uh, that long commercial, because the next test is not as long. 
Okay, so it won't be the barn burner that that one was. It'll be more like 120, 150 questions. It won't feel like horrible. Um, and the vocab also 71 through 90. So let me go back to the vocab. We fixed our syllabus, right? 17 through 19. Uh, so let, let me go to the vocab. 71 through 80 today. So fill, hydrophilic, right? Lipophilic. Philic means a love of an affinity for. So something that has fill in it is loving. Neutrophil. We'll see about neutrophils in the blood unit. Um, then phobe. If you have a phobia, you have an abnormal fear, a dread of something. Fram, a partition. Diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is the muscle between your thoracic and abdominal cavities. It is a partition that separates those two cavities one from another. Physis, epiphysis, metaphysis, symphysis. We saw that physis term before, meaning growth. Physio, since day one. Physiology, the study of how things work, the function of our bodies. Pilo, uh, in the skin, we saw that there were little smooth muscles that pulled up all the hairs of your uh, skin. Those were the pilo erector muscles. Uh, pino, chapter three, pinocytosis and phagocytosis. Phagocytosis was cellular eating, phage, and pinocytosis was cellular slurping or drinking. I always think pina colada, right? So pinocytosis is drinking or slurping. It's, it's kind of testing the environment. And then plasia is growth or formation. So hyperplasia would be excessive growth. Plasty, rhinoplasty, a nose job, some sort of surgical repair. If you have a plantar wart, it is a wart on the bottom of your foot, on the sole of your foot. So plantar means the bottom of your foot. Uh, plantar flexion, recall, was the uh, movement of the ankle where the toe is brought up toward, the, toward your face. Platy, a platypus, a flat, a sided type thing. In your body, you have a muscle called the platysma. The platysma is the one that allows you to do this. Right? That flat muscle in your neck, that's your platysma. It wasn't on our list of muscles this semester. Plegia, plegia is paralysis. Hemi, plegia is half paralysis, maybe from a stroke. And paraplegia or quadriplegia, we know, could be the result of spinal cord injury. You know that a plexus is a group, a twisted woven group of nerves that travel together. And penia um, is breathing. Um, apnea, sleep apnea, right, where you stop breathing. Or um, you see in the, the next term pneumonia or pneumo. So you see that P-N-E-A term meaning breathing or gas or lungs. Pod. If you have foot issues, you go to the podiatrist for foot-related issues. Poesis, the making of, the formation of something. Erythropoiesis would be the formation of new red blood cells. Poly, many. Um, polymer, right? What's mer? Part, right? So polymer is something made up of many parts. Post, after, postnatal, postpartum, and prim, First, think primitive or like a primer, a primer kind of book, a first, a first reading book. Pre and pro, uh, before in time, prenatal, before birth. Prosect, as another example. If you were to go to Grand Valley and take anatomy, there would be in the anatomy lab course cadavers that would have already been prosected for you. You're not going to pick up a scalpel in those introductory anatomy courses. You're not cutting on any cadaver. You are simply going to be examining an already prosected body. It was done for you in advance. They've exposed certain nerves, muscles, or structures. You're simply looking at it, okay? You wouldn't be dissecting until a more advanced course. Procto, anus, or rectum. We know those are two different things, right? The anus is the sphincter, the rectum is the straight portion, but both, procto, refers to both of those. Pseudo. We've seen pseudostratified columnar, um, means faults, and psych, right? Pretty good TV show, uh, referring to mind. Taro, pterodactyls. They were the flying dinosaurs. Taro is wing. Something that's pterygoid would be a wing-shaped something. Name for me a wing-shaped bone. What do you think? Scapula, maybe a little bit. The one that, that looks kind of like a butterfly, you look in the scalp, you look in the, in the head. 
the sphenoid. You remember the sphenoid? You look down, it kind of looks like a butterfly or some sort of bird, okay, wings. Py pylor. We saw the pylorus. The pyloric sphincter, the pylorus, is the last region of the stomach. It literally means gatekeeper. So it is the last gatekeeper before food leaves the stomach and goes into the intestines. If you have a pyogenic infection, it is one that is forming pus. Not to be confused with a pyro genic infection, one that is causing fever. So look at those two terms. Pyo is pus. Pyro, maybe you know a pyro, right? Somebody who loves playing with firecrackers and fire, right? That's a pyro. Uh, heat or fever. And then quad, um, there's a typo in there. It should be quadriceps femoris, right? That's the muscle group we know in the front of our leg. And quadriplegia, fourfold paralysis. What we learned about a ramus was Remember, the spinal nerves come off from the spinal cord, and then they split branches. There was the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus. The anterior was the larger of the two branches. So we know ramus, or rami means branch. Re, back, retro. To rehabilitate is to bring someone back into their normal habits, okay, back to their normal abilities. Uh, rect, we know means straight, and there's another typo. Rectus abdominis ends in what? IS, right? Yeah, not US. So that's a typo on my part. And then reno, renal, referring to the kidney. The renal artery, the one going to the kidney. Ret or reti. Think retinaculum. Think reticulum. Re think reticulum, right? The endoplasmic reticulum, a network of fibers, a network of, of membranes inside a cell. The retina is a network of nerve endings that receive light. Retro, sort of like re, uh, backward or behind. Retroperitoneal means that it's behind the peritoneum. When we get to the kidneys, we will see that the kidneys are actually retroperitoneal. They're not in your abdominal cavity. They're actually, quote, behind it. Rhino, the nose, and rigor. After death, the body goes into a state of rigor mortis. That is the stiffness of death. We'll talk, well, we talked a little bit, little bit about that, right? Just a touch that after death, ATP is no longer available, and that causes the muscles to go into a state of rigor. Last one for today, rage, right? It, like a hemorrhage, an excessive flow. Hemorrhage would be an excessive flow of hemo, of blood. Rhea, discharge or flow, diarrhea. It literally means what? What did dia mean? Across or through. So diarrhea is flow through the body. We know what that feels like. And menorrhea, right, be the flow of menstrual solutions. Rube, ruby slippers, right, referring to red. And finally, rugo are the folds, the grooves, the, sort of the waviness that you see, the wrinkles that you see inside the stomach, the rugae. So that gets us through the first half. And then you're going to make up your cards, and you're going to go all the way through tract. Right, so tract. Fill to tract. Fill to tract on number five. That only leaves 10 more slides, right? And those last 12 slides or so will be on the final exam. So we're getting awfully close. This is like our little barometer, right? So what does this tell me? That we are essentially 80% of the way through the course. Two more weeks, guys, right? Two more weeks. Next week, you've got a cardiovascular exam, number five. Two weeks after that, it's your final exam. So we're in the last two and a half weeks of class. We really are. It's getting really, really close. So moving over now to the heart. Now, I might, I might be able to talk about blood as well, but I'm going to assume at this point that I have to move forward, and let's just go to the heart chapter. And then we'll go back. And this is chapter um, 18, right? I think for you guys it's 18. Is that correct, 18? Yeah. Okay. So again, a lot of what I'm going to present to you right now are exactly the same slides or similar to. So you're skipping over. I'm sorry. You're skipping over the senses, yep. Um, and I'll fill you in on that in a minute. And then keep on going. And we're flipping over to page. 178. 170 was where blood began. And we're going to begin with the heart on 178. Now, that information in the middle, 
um, on the special senses. There'll be a little bit of that on the take-home exam. Okay. So I, I um, the last couple of semesters have not been lecturing on that, and I've just been giving you that take-home exam. Okay. So you won't be tested on what you just skipped over. Those pages will not be tested on in a lecture exam. So don't don't stress about that. So let's talk about the heart. Uh, this is a slide you've not seen before. In the average size adult, the heart's going to beat about 75 times a minute. That's going to be an average number of beats per minute across the population, including young and old people. That means that it's pumping amazingly, 4,500 times an hour. Don't memorize these, but 4,500 times an hour or 108,000 times a day. Right? The heart is an amazing organ. It's pumping about five and a quarter liters per minute or nearly 8,000 liters a day. How much blood do you have in your body? Five to six liters. So what am I telling you? That basically every minute, your entire blood volume has been pumped. It's kind of another way of thinking about it. The heart is, of course, the very center of your cardiovascular system. And we've been learning in lab that the heart is connected to vessels that are going to send and receive that blood. The arteries, always away from the heart. The veins, always bringing that blood back toward the heart. Arteries usually carry blood high in oxygen. We know the exception. I should say exceptions, right? The exceptions are the pulmonary arteries, which we know are blue, as are the umbilical arteries during development. The other vessels are the veins. We know that they are usually blue, carrying blood lower in oxygen, with the exceptions, of course, being the pulmonary veins and the umbilical veins being red. The arteries and veins that directly enter and leave the heart are referred to as the great vessels. So name for me, please, the four great vessels. Superior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary, the big one coming in and out, big ones. Trunk, right, the big blue one coming out, the pulmonary trunk, and finally the inferior vena cava, right? So the two vena cava, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, because they're those big ones, right? Those guys are all about an inch of around in diameter. Those are big old garden hoses coming on and off the heart. So those are referred to as the great vessels. Your pulmonary veins, not a wrong answer, but they're nowhere near as big. So I don't think they're usually called the great vessels, okay? They are the, but they are, you're right, they are directly coming into the heart. So what do we know about the heart? The heart and the blood flowing through the body is unidirectional, right? Blood's only moving in one direction. The backflow of blood is prohibited, prevented by valves in the heart. We've seen the four valves. Remember, there are also some valves in your veins. They're also going to help make sure that blood moves in just one direction. And the heart is really like two independent side-by-side -side pumps. Cardiologists will talk about the right heart and the left heart. They'll actually, sort of like neurologists will talk about the left brain and the right brain. We know that the two parts of the brain aren't mere images, and you've already seen in lab that the two parts of the heart are not mere images. You know that the right side is nowhere near as muscular. You know that the left side is thicker, far more muscular. So we know that they're not equal in their job. Which side is all about getting blood to the lungs? The right side, right? And we've seen that it's not as muscular. So it only has to pump blood just over to the lung. So it doesn't have to work as hard, does it? The left side is far more muscular. It has to pump blood all the way up against gravity to your brain. And it has to pump blood all the way to your other organs. And that is the left side. So the right side is really all about gas exchange. And the left side is really more about delivering oxygen and delivering nutrients to your body systems. Now, which side of the heart, left or right, do you think pumps more blood? It's a terribly trick question, right? Think about the arteries and veins. It's a, what we would call a closed system. If your left heart or your right heart was pumping more blood than the other side, there'd be a backup or an overflow somewhere very quick. So the two sides of the heart, even though they are more, one's more muscular than the other, the volume 
is essentially the same. And it must be, right? Otherwise, it'd be a big backup. Does everyone make sense of that? Now, if you got that down, let me ask you a challenge question. What if someone had heart disease? Maybe they have a heart disease or they've had a heart attack, and the right side of the heart is damaged. It can't work as efficiently as the left side. What would be one of the symptoms? They're going to need oxygen, sure. What about blood flow? Where? Okay, remember, I mentioned this in lab. Um, yeah, you, you would need a pacemaker. Hold on to that, though. Remember, not only does the, I may be ahead of myself, not only does the heart push, but it also is sucking blood back. If the right side can't suck back as efficiently, where are you going to see the swelling? Legs, hands, or lungs? If the right side can't pull back as well, the right side is receiving blood from all over your body, isn't it? So a person with right heart issues might have swelling in their ankles and even in their arms. Whereas a person with left a heart issues, where is it being pulled back from? The lungs. So a person with left heart damage might start having accumulation of fluid around the lungs and would have um, like congestive heart failure. Their heart is, is not working and fluid is building up around the lungs, which we'll better understand next week or in two weeks uh, is going to make it very, very difficult for breathing. Okay, so we know that the heart is going to be pumping and the heart takes uh, turns, um, pumping and relaxing, pumping and relaxing, and that's referred to as the heart cycle or the contraction cycle of the heart. You need a certain minimal amount of blood pressure in order to keep the organs happy, to keep your brain full of blood that it needs, delivering the oxygen and the nutrients it needs, there must be sufficient pressure. If your heart is very, very poorly working and it's not sending blood forcefully enough to your brain, right, your brain will shut down. If your heart is shutting down and you're not getting enough blood to your kidneys, your kidneys will shut down. So a person in those last stages, if they're in an ICU unit and their heart's very, very weak, you'll hear the doctor say they're going into multi-organ failure. Typically, the heart just can't send blood sufficiently uh, to those organs, and those organs basically shut down as a result of not getting oxygen and nutrients. Now, the pulmonary circuit. This is the side of the heart. Uh, this is really the right side of the heart, isn't it? This is the side that's pumping blood over to the lungs. Its job is to pump blood into the pulmonary arteries, right, for oxygen to be added to the blood. It's going to return back on the left side, and then it's, we're going to say it's entering the systemic side, the systemic circuit, and that's on the left side, where now we're going to pump that blood out very forcefully out of the aorta and send it out the aorta and then to all the other named arteries that we learned, like the femoral and the brachial and the iliac arteries. This blood that's leaving the left side of the heart should be oxygenated, right? So we know everything on the left side of the heart is red. It's sending oxygen up and out the aorta, and that blood is going to enter into arteries. We've talked already in lab that those arteries are going to get smaller and smaller as they travel further and further away from the heart. Eventually, those arteries will carry that oxygenated blood into the capillaries, and the capillaries as you know, are where the gas exchanges occur. Were any of you ever taught that arteries, really, really small arteries, are called capillaries? Seems to me that I was kind of taught that along the way, that arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller and, quote, become capillaries. And I want to in impress upon you that capillaries are really their own, their only thing. They're not just small arteries, okay? They are their own different kind of structure. After the blood has been sent through the capillaries, that blood is going to come back now through veins. That blood has now been deoxygenated. Not completely. I don't want you to think that the blood leaving the capillaries is completely lacking oxygen. And how can you prove that to yourself? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. 
basically the right side of the heart is the one directing the pulmonary circuit. So the right side is pumping to the pulmonary arteries and then to the lung. And then coming back, that would also, in the pulmonary veins, that would still be the pulmonary circuit, okay? And then not until we're in the left side and then pump out, then we're in the systemic circuit. Fair enough? Now, what I was getting to was this idea of how can you prove to yourself that the blood is not completely oxygen free after it leaves the capillaries? Any thought? You can prove it to yourself by jumping into a pool and going underwater and holding your breath. Okay? How long can you hold your breath? Maybe not you, but how long can a person with some training hold their breath? Two, three, four minutes, right, with a lot of training. What does that tell us? The heart is pumping that blood around every minute. And so if you can stay underwater for three or four minutes, that suggests that your brain is able to stay active because there's still oxygen in your blood. So once the blood has gone around to your body and comes back, we call it blue blood. It's not free of oxygen. It's not empty of oxygen. It just has less oxygen. So it's less oxygenated, OK? Uh, I know we call it deoxygenated or oxygen poor, but there's still quite a bit of blood. I mean, there's still quite a bit of oxygen in that blood, OK? Just imagine jumping in the, in the deep end and holding your breath. You know you can do that for a few minutes. And that blood's going around and around and around. And you're in your, in your heart. And, you're, and your um, brain is still able to function. Now, you know that as that blood comes back through veins, that it's going to merge into the inferior and superior vena cava. Recall everything coming from the legs and from the trunk, pretty much everything below the heart, draining up through the inferior. Everything above the heart, that is from the head, the neck, and the arms, is going to come over into the superior vena cava. And I don't have it here, but the blood coming back from the heart itself would return through the coronary sinus. And then around and around we go. Okay. So here would be an anatomically, sort of an anatomically correct circuit. You should have the ability now to trace your finger along this route. Um, and what you'll notice is that everything on the right side is blue. Everything on the red side, sorry, on the left side is red. Um, you should appreciate as we go to the lungs, what's happening? Blue's going in and red's coming out. Whereas when you go to the tissues, red is going in and blue is coming out of the capillaries. Right? So remember that there's a reversal even in the capillaries. Normally when you think of capillaries, you think, ah, oh, my, my blood is delivering oxygen to my tissues. But in the lung, it's flipped because the capillaries are coming in and becoming re-oxygenated. So blue comes in and red comes out. So some of this we know. We know that the heart is about the size of your fist. In two weeks in lab, we will be dissecting full-size hearts. These will be from full-size sows that went to market, uh, full-size pigs. These pigs have human-sized lungs and human-sized hearts. So you'll see that the heart is about the size of your fist. And it's located slightly on the left side of your thoracic cavity. Now, there are some people in the world who are born with everything reversed. They have what's called dex, dextrocardia, and dextro, recall, means to the right of. So they actually have their heart on the right side, and usually all the other plumbing is equally reversed. They're like a left versus a right-handed snail. Everything just kind of reversed in a different coiling pattern, um, and they can live just normal. Sometimes uh, during development, the heart may be on the right side, but the rest of the plumbing didn't get the message to flip, and so those, those kids are born with some serious plumbing issues. But typically, dextrocardia, uh, these people are just normal. They're just literally internal uh, mirror images of each other, but normally on the left side. And it is turned so that the apex, right? You know, remember the apex, the point, is pointing downward, okay, and a little bit anteriorly, so a little bit down and um, toward the front a little bit. I'll show you this uh, in a picture. And then the top of the heart is referred to as the base. That seems weird, doesn't it? But the top where the aorta and the pulmonary trunk are leaving, 
uh, where the inferior, sorry, where the superior vena cava is entering, that's referred to as the base, and then the apex is the pointy, more bottom portion. So we're saying that the heart points antero-inferiorly. What does that mean? Both to downward and to the front. So the apex is, is downward toward the left side and a little bit pointing outward. So here is a cartoon to kind of get it. As you can see, the heart is beautifully protected. It is directly behind the sternum. It is protected by the ribs and the costal cartilage. It is protected from the back from the vertebra. It is also protected from each side by those big spongy lungs. So very, very well protected. And as we look at this drawing, right, that's the left. So it's pointing down to the left, and this muscle would be the diaphragm. This is an actual prosected view of the heart. Now, if you're looking at this, if you were looking directly at a heart, if you had a heart in your hand, the most anterior thing that you would see would be this. And this is the pulmonary trunk. So the thing that kind of is in the front, the most prominent thing you're going to see in front of your heart would be the pulmonary trunk. Remember the aorta kind of goes back behind the pulmonary trunk and then comes up and around. So you can see here, this is the aortic arch up here, and you can even see some branches coming up. So everyone tell me, what is this branch right there? The first branch coming off the aortic arch? Brachiocephalic trunk. See, it's kind of big, isn't it? Then the second branch, going right up to the left side of the neck? Left common carotid, and we can't see it, but there'll be another branch that goes over to the right subclavian, or the left subclavian, sorry. Clearly, this is the smoker's lung, right? We can see the lovely black. Um, diaphragm here, right? What has been pulled back here is they pulled back the pericardium. And I'm going to tell you more about the pericardium. The sac that the heart sits in has been kind of pulled back in this particular view. Here's a more idealized cartoon of this whole thing. So again, we've got the lovely lungs protecting the, the heart. We've got the diaphragm on the bottom. We've got the sternum in the front that's not showing here. And coming out of the base of the heart, there's the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, and the superior vena cava. Apex pointing down into the left and a little bit to the front anteriorly. If I slice right through this area, let me also go back. What do we call this whole area right in the center? What do we call pretty much all of this between the lungs. Yeah, the mediastinum, right? So there's that word. The mediastinum is that area in between the lungs, and the heart is definitely contained within the mediastinum. If I slice, as you see back here, if I take a slice right through, right, this slice, and now I go to the next picture, what I see now is looking down uh, on a cross-section view. And it tells us, that this is posterior. I know it's posterior because here are my vertebra, right? There's my vertebra. And my left lung, my right lung. I can see the heart. I can see this would be the aortic arch. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Aortic arch. This would be the pulmonary trunk splitting to the pulmonary arteries going off to the lungs. And this would be the superior vena cava opening as I look down. What is this thing? that flattened thing back there. You see it? Esophagus. Remember how deep the esophagus is? We talked about how the esophagus is really closer to the back of your head than it is to the front of your, your neck because it's right up along the vertebra. So you can appreciate once again how close, right, how close the esophagus is to your vertebra. Now, the pericardium, you've been dreaming about this since the first week of classes. When you hear about the pericardium, what comes to mind? Remember, there were three serous membranes, right? Pericardium, pleura, and peritoneum. Double layer around the heart, right? And that's what we said. And um, there was a visceral layer. And what's the visceral layer? 
That's what we also call the epicardium. And we would say that that's the layer that shrink wrap to the surface of the heart. And then there was the parietal pericardium, which would line the what? The wall, right? Parietal means wall. The wall. Nobody ever asks me this question. What wall? Think about it for a second. Think about the pleura. Are you with me for a second? The parietal pleura is on the lung. I'm sorry, did I say parietal? The visceral pleura is shrink-wrapped on the lung. The parietal pleura is where? Lining the thoracic wall, cavity. Peritoneum. The visceral peritoneum is shrink-wrapped on the surface of your gut organs. The parietal peritoneum was lining the abdominal pelvic cavity, wall. Let's keep going. Pericardium, visceral layer, shrink-wrapped on the surface of the heart. Parietal layer, lining the wall of what, right? And what I didn't tell you is that the pericardium means more than just the serous membrane. There is also a fibrous pericardium. This is a connective tissue sac in which the heart rests. So when I say the parietal pericardium, I'm referring to a layer that lines the inside wall of the sac. This sac is rather significant and is going to help anchor the heart into its proper place. This sac, this leather sac, is going to hold the heart and keep it attached to the sternum and it's going to also attach the heart down to the diaphragm. So you can do gymnastics and your heart's going to stay there, right? It's not going to bounce around. So I'm going to show you now that there's actually three parts to the pericardium. There is the fibrous pericardium. This is new. But then there's those two layers of the serous pericardium that you already appreciate. So let's take a look at this as we also think about the wall of the heart. This is something we talked about in lab. The heart wall has three distinct layers. There's the external layer, referred to as the epicardium. And I heard someone already say that epicardium is the same as the visceral pericardium, right? The shrink wrap layer to the heart. What kind of tissue is that? What kind of tissue makes up the visceral pericardium? any of the serous membranes. Simple squamous, right? We're not talking about something really thick here, folks, right? Simple squamous. It's a very, very thin layer on top of the heart. Not something you could actually touch. I mean, you could touch it, but not something you could actually, you know, appreciate on a model. Then the thick layer of the heart, you know, is called the myocardium. This is the cardiac muscle. If you looked at this under the microscope, what would you see? Intercalated discs, striations, right? Remember we saw cardiac muscle before, the blue bamboo from long ago, but then we saw it as pink as well. And then the inside layer of the heart, the layer is called the endocardium. And we know endo means within. So it's a layer within the chambers of the heart. This is wherever the blood touches, that would be the endocardium. And the valves are also covered by this layer called the endocardium. As we age, it's natural for more fat to get deposited in the epicardium. So the layer on the outside of the heart becomes thicker as we get older. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look. Take our moment to get our bearings here. We're sliced into the heart. What is this end? We call this the apex. apex. If I took a scalpel and I poked directly into the apex, where am I? the left ventricle. So I'm going to be taking, and, and you know the left ventricle is very muscular. So if you take a scalpel and you poke it into the apex, you're going to be dealing with some very thick muscle there of the left ventricle. What would this valve be that I just circled? Let's back up. What chamber is this up here? 
Okay, that's the left atrium. Then what is that, what is that valve? Bicuspid or mitral or left atrioventricular. That makes all this area down here the left ventricle. We see the thick muscle. We also see what? These muscles on the side are the papillary, papillary muscles, and they are attached to the chordae tendineae. Okay. Uh, then, what would this valve back here be that's hiding back behind be? That would be the aortic, semilunar, the aortic valve. Yes? We got that? Now, that was just a quick thinking about the heart. Down here, that pink is the diaphragm. What we really want to focus on, though, we're going to take this little box right here, and we're going to zoom in. Let me clear this off. And the layer that's on the heart, what would that layer be? The visceral layer, right, or the epicardium. Remember when we talked about serous membranes, we always say there's a little bit of fluid in between those layers, the serous fluid, so that when the heart pumps, it's not building up friction, right? We wouldn't want to get warmed up by rubbing on itself. So the second layer would be, I'm going to change colors, this layer, red, would be the parietal pericardium. Okay. Now, what is it lining? That parietal pericardium is basically, changing colors again, is lining this thick fibrous pericardium. So that's the new part, right? This fibrous section is new for you to appreciate. And look what that fibrous pericardium is doing. It's helping to anchor the heart down to the diaphragm. And we'll also see in a moment that that layer helps to anchor the heart to the sternum. So the heart's not going anywhere. Do you all have an appreciation of that? Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. that, that third layer is tough sometimes to appreciate because up until now I've been sort of giving you a half truth, right? When I say the pericardium, you're picturing just two layers. There's actually a third layer with that sac. You've seen this slide before. That is that the heart wall has three layers. And I had a slide just a moment ago about this as well. So the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. The myocardium, the muscle layer, if one was to have a heart attack, they'd have an MI, right, a myocardial infarction. So damage has occurred to the cardiac muscle. Endocardium, important if you hear about endocarditis. So that's an inflammation, an infection of the lining of the heart, which can damage the valves. And if you damage the valves, the heart's not, the blood's not going to move properly. So valves are incredibly important. Here are those three layers in a cartoon representation. So we've taken a little chunk out of the heart. We're going to take a look at it. So the inside layer, that is the endocardium, pretty thin. The vast majority of the heart will be the myocardium. And then the outer layer is the epicardium. And I told you that as we age, more fat gets accumulated. So there's fat that accumulates underneath the epicardium with age. So it gets a little bit thicker. If I took a quick look in here, I would see those striations in the intercalated discs in the cardiac muscle. Just a quick review. What do we know? What do we remember? We've already said this, actually. If I'm looking under the microscope and I'm looking at cardiac muscle tissue, let's compare cardiac muscle tissue with skeletal muscle tissue. Remember, skeletal muscle tissue, the cells are as long as the muscle is. Very, very long, skinny cells. We saw the sarcomeres in that giving us the overlapping, overlapping actins and myosins, and that gave you the appearance of striations. Remember, too, that in skeletal muscle, the nuclei were shoved off to the side because they were so full of myofibrils. In cardiac muscle, the fibers are not as long. So they're not as long as skeletal, so, quote, relatively short. And rather than being long, skinny pieces of spaghetti, they tend to have branches, Y-shaped branches. So you'll see branching and shorter cells. You might see one and sometimes two nuclei. Notice that they're more central. So they're not shoved off to the side like they are in skeletal muscle. 
and lots of mitochondria, right? Because the heart must have a constant supply of oxygen, and that oxygen is necessary uh, along with the glucose to make uh, ATP for the heart. Now, another thing that's interesting about the heart, have you thought about this? Where are the pulmonary trunk and aorta leaving the heart? Up at the top, at the base. When the ventricles squeeze, they don't just squeeze. They actually squeeze and twist and ring, almost like you're ringing on a mop. So as the ventricle squeezes, it twists. And what that's going to do is push the blood up and out of the ventricle on the left side into the aorta, on the right side up and out the pulmonary trunk. Okay, so there's a ringing, a circular motion. Here I've got the word spiral, right? So the cells are in a spiral arrangement that are going to twist as the heart squeezes. Remember, too, that this muscle is striated, and the heart is a very, quote, red muscle, and that's because there's such a rich vascular supply. So the heart muscle and uh, skeletal muscle are very vascular. The other thing is, is that when the heart pumps, we want both atria to squeeze at the same time, and then we want the two ventricles to squeeze at the same time. If they weren't coordinated, we'd be in trouble. Not only do we need that coordination, but we also need to make sure that all of the cells are squeezing at the same time. And that's where those intercalated discs come in. What intercalated discs are, they really are electrical synapses. Do you remember back in, actually, the, the lecture that I gave you when I wasn't here? It was on synapses, on the introduction of the nervous system. And I mentioned that there were chemical synapses. Chemical synapses were ones where um, something like acetylcholine was released and went from one cell and bounced over to the next cell. Okay. But then there were also electrical synapses, where rather than a chemical being released, the electrical signal could travel from one cell directly into the next cell through some sort of gate in between the cells. That's what those intercalated disks are. They really are little gates that allow for electrical signals to travel from one cell directly into the next. No need for a chemical intermediate. Very rapid. So that when the heart gets the instruction to squeeze, all the cells of the atria squeeze together. And then we'll see later that then all the cells of the ventricles will squeeze. And that, that, co that uh, coordination is critical. Critical, critical, critical. Uh, here is just a cartoon representation of cardiac muscle. And what do we see here? Coming in, change colors. Again, I see a, a, a part of a cell coming in or going out, sort of that Y-shaped branching. I still see striation. I still see striping patterns. And this on the side, this little squiggle, represents the intercalated disc. Lots of nuclei, OK, one or two nuclei per cell, more central, not squished off to the side like it was in skeletal muscle, and hard to see in this picture, but there are lots of mitochondria also in here. So a highly, you know, a cell with lots and lots of ATP being made. Now, what intercalated discs truly are, they are a combination of desmosomes and gap junctions. Those were two terms we talked about way back in epithelial chapter. Desmosomes, remember what those were? They were like the button, the snap, the rivet that you find between cells to hold them together. And you find these desmosomes in tissues that are under a lot of stress. I would argue that the heart's under a lot of stress. It's squeezing and relaxing constantly. So it's really like a reinforcement button. But also gap junctions. Gap junctions are like little channels, little t channels, pores between cells. So you've got this reinforcement of desmosome combined with the tunnel pore of a gap junction. That's what allows for that electrical signal to pass so quickly, and that's the basic mindset I want you to think about for intercalated discs. Do not, do not, do not go back and revisit I, A, M, and Z. Okay, don't worry about that. I just want to remind you that cardiac muscle is, in fact, striated. 
and under the microscope, remember we saw those intercalated discs. Does everybody have their eye trained on those? I'm going back. Is everyone seeing the intercalated disc here? There's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, right? Kind of a perpendicular line. Once you see them, they jump out at you. Okay, so let's start talking about the heart. And actually, um, most of this is what we went through in lab last week when we went through the flow of blood through the heart. As I talk through this, I'm going to go through the chambers and the valves, and I'm going to do a flyover on that pretty quick. I'm only going to cover the things that are unique or new or, or in a de deeper detail than what we did in lab. But you know that the heart is composed of four chambers, two atria, two ventricles. You know that the atria are more superior. You know, especially you'll see in two weeks when we do the dissection, but these are rather wimpy. They're not extremely muscular at all. Uh, they are quite thin, and they have on their outside an auricle. Right? You've seen the auricle, the flappy ear-like extension on the surface of the heart. The atria are receiving blood. The right atrium is receiving blood from where? From all over the body. It's coming in as blue blood. The left atrium is receiving blood from the lungs, coming in as red oxygenated blood. The term atrium means entryway. So the entryway into the heart, the atrium. Now we know that the blood that comes in on the right side stays on the right side. That wasn't true during fetal development, right? Recall that during the fetal development, blood that came into the right side was already oxygenated from the mother's umbilical cord, mother's umbilical uh, structures. And so the blood went from the right side and jumped over to the left side. That does not happen in our heart once we're born. So we're just going to talk about the adult heart or the heart right after birth. So at this point, blood's going to come into the atrium and it's going to pass down to the ventricle on the same side. The ventricle are, ventricles are the more inferior chambers, and you've seen them. They're much bigger, they're thicker, they're more muscular. Leaving out of the ventricles are the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. The pulmonary trunk is leaving what side? Right. And the aorta is leaving out of the left. Okay, I'm just going you, to, you've got to have this, uh, you're, you're all doing well, but I, I'm, I'm, you've got to have this picture. You've got to have this, this video kind of playing in your head as we go through this. The pulmonary trunk, you know, is carrying blue blood. So it's carrying blood away from the heart, heading toward the lungs. That's part of that pulmonary circuit. And the aorta is going to be t sending blood out of the left side that's red into your systemic circuit. So I'm going to point, and you're just going to tell me what this is. Imagine there's a green sticker on these places. Let me find some green. There we go. So apex, apex. pulmonary trunk, pulmonary, trunk. pulmonary artery. artery. Left or right? Left. Right pulmonary arteries. Superior vena cava. Let me change colors so we're not getting too blinded by the green. Inferior vena cava. Right auricle. Left. Oracle. Left pulmonary veins. Right pulmonary veins. Aorta. You could also call the ascending aorta. Now we've all been to lab, so what about this guy? Brachiocephalic trunk. What happens that we don't see here? This guy's going to split, and it's going to split into right subclavian and right common carotid. Left common carotid. left sub 
Clavian. Okay, so for anyone who's a football, college football plan, uh, uh, fan, okay, BCS. So B, brachiocephalic, C, common carotid, S, subclavian. Okay. Uh, that's most of this, right? Uh, what else? Do, what do we have on the outside? What is this groove that kind of goes, oops, what is this groove that kind of goes all the way around the heart as a belt, all the way around? Coronary sulcus. And the other name for that coronary, there it is, in the coronary sulcus. The other name for that coronary sulcus atrioventricular sulcus because it divides the atria from the ventricles on the outside. What do we call these arteries that I see on the outside of the heart? The arteries are the coronary arteries and the veins that I'm seeing on the outside of the heart would be the cardiac veins. <coughs> what do we think? That's a lot of little dots. How do we do? Reasonable? Yes. Coronary veins? I do not know. It's just to trick you. It's the coronary arteries and the cardiac veins. And I've never known why they flipped the name. Why aren't they just the coronary veins? Or why aren't they the cor cardiac arteries? I don't know. Just. That's right. If someone said, you know what, they've only got 8,000 terms. Let's give them 8,001. So, structures of the heart we're pretty strong on. This is the actual heart. I wouldn't ask you to label this, but again, if you had a heart in your hand, you were looking at your patient, the thing that is going to be the most prominent, the most anterior thing you're going to see is the pulmonary trunk. And then up behind it, up and over, would be the aorta. And what do we see here? That's the big branch. That's the brachiocephalic trunk. See how big it is? And then the second one is the left common carotid, and the third one, almost hard to see there, is the left subclavian, and then what would happen? That aorta goes up and over the aortic arch, would go back behind and come down behind the heart. You can also appreciate that these arteries, I mean, look at these arteries. These coronary arteries are no small structure, right? They are, they are pretty big arteries. And these are the arteries, should they get blocked, you're having a heart attack. So those ones that they would do like a balloon? Those ones that they do the, the balloon uh, angioplasty or do a bypass, okay? In fact, we can talk about that right now. Um, let me clear this off. Let's say you guys have an understanding of the heart. Let's say we had a blood clot, and I'm going to draw a blood clot as a big old red thing. What if we had a blood clot way up here? What's going to happen? All of this is going to get lack of oxygen, right? It's going to die. What part of the heart has died off? Left ventricle. Pretty major deal, right? Because that's the workhorse. You're likely not going to survive that. Right? That's a massive coronary, a massive heart attack, because you've lost the majority of the function of your heart. Now, what if instead that blockage was here? only a small portion of the heart has been damaged. You're gonna survive that. Yeah, your heart will be a little bit weaker and it won't be able to pump as forcefully because when cardiac muscle is destroyed, it does not regenerate. Once it's, it's destroyed, it's replaced by fibrous tissue that does not contract like muscle. It just kind of sits there and goes along for the ride, but it's not helping to squeeze. So that's what's so devastating. Again, what if I had a, a problem here? Right, if I had a blockage way up there, I'm going to block blood to most of my right ventricle. You know, you might survive it, but you're going to have some major issues. Versus if instead that heart attack was simply caused by a blockage way down there, and you're only going to damage a small part of the heart. Right, so that's the difference. It's where, random, bad luck, as to where that clot is. Now, if you go into the doctor and they do some testing, and they realize you know, you're having some chest pains, and they do an angiogram. They do a study of your heart, and they look at the vessels, and they discover 
that, let's say, for example, there's a, almost a complete blockage here. It's not complete, but it's almost. What can they do? There's like three things. They can now go in with a little balloon and basically pump up that balloon and get that crap that's blocking it to be pushed off to the side, number one. Number two, they could go in with a little bit of chicken wire and like put a little stent in, like a little chicken wire to kind of keep that vessel open. And then thirdly, if it's really, really closed, they actually now will take part of a vein and they'll bypass it. And they'll literally do a little bypass. They'll take a little vein and they'll bypass around that clot. So when a person, you hear them going in, they're having a quadruple bypass. That's a very lucky person because they realize there are four vessels that were about to get completely closed and they've been able to surgically go around it or correct it and give them five or ten more years before it happens again. I mean, Dick Cheney has had how many sur heart surgeries and he's still ticking, right? So we know that it's amazing what can be done now with a heart. 25 years ago, you know, a blockage like that was devastating. Now we have marvelous tools to work around it. Now, externally, what else do we know? We have sulci. What are sulci? Just like on the brain? The grooves. Grooves. And there were three sulci that you needed to know on the heart. And here they are again in words. There was the coronary sulcus, also referred to as the atrioventricular sulcus. That's the one that goes around the entire circumference of the heart like a belt. Then there's the anterior interventricular sulcus, and the posterior interventricular sulcus. Those words should tell you exactly where they are and what they are. In the front, anterior, interventricular, between the ventricles, there's a groove, sulcus, right? And that's true both on the front and on the bottom side, on the posterior side. These sulci extend from the coronary sulcus toward the apex. So what I'm saying there is that here is the, I'm going to put a yellow line on it. That line represents pretty much the coronary sulcus. This line represents the posterior interventricular sulcus. And you see that these grooves start at the coronary sulcus and go toward the apex. Here we're looking at the underside of the heart. So let me just do some more labeling on this and ignore the labels and just kind of look up and follow along. What would this be? What chamber? That's the left atrium. On our models in the lab, that's the back door of the heart, right? It kind of flapped down. And what do you see coming into that? Yeah, pulmonary veins bringing red blood into the left atrium. What is this? Blue. I should change my color. That is the coronary sinus. And what is that? That was where all of the cardiac veins, right, all these blue veins are going to drain back toward, they're going to go toward the right atrium. They're first all going to collect in the coronary sulcus, in the coronary sinus. Do you agree? Those two words get confused. Do you agree that the coronary sinus is sitting within the coronary sulcus, right? That that blood filling area is protected in part by this sulcus. Yep, so all the veins, yep, so let me do All of the veins are draining back into this blue structure, this coronary sinus, and then the coronary sinus, we can't see it here, but the coronary sinus then drains back into the right atrium. Here's the heart, again, uh, I'm not going to have you label anything that looks like this, but you can appreciate, again, that this coronary sinus is not an insignificant structure. I mean, it's pretty obvious, this big collection area on the bottom side of the heart. Okay, there's one more structure that I've not introduced before, and that is the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Your body has a skeleton, helps maintain your shape, so too the heart has a skeleton. It's not made of bones, 
but it is made of fibrous connective tissue. And this skeleton of the heart is going to help it maintain its shape, maintain four, four chambers, maintain a place for the valves to hang out. Uh, this is dense, irregular connective tissue, and it is going to basically separate the atria from the ventricles. So internally, what's going to separate the atria from the ventricles, it's also going to anchor the heart valves, and you'll see a better picture of that in a moment. I told you a moment ago that the atria squeeze and then the ventricles squeeze. You wouldn't want all four chambers of the heart squeezing at the same time. So the two atria squeeze, then the two ventricles squeeze. There's a time lapse in between. There's a, there's a hiccup of time in between that squeezing. And the fibrous skeleton actually creates an electrical insulation so that all four chambers don't squeeze at the same time. And uh, again, this creates a, a, a framework for the heart. So let's take a look at this. I've never had anyone able to do this. Someday, maybe. But theoretically, if you were to slice the heart at just the right angle, you would catch all four valves in the same plane. Okay? So if you cut pretty much right along the coronary sulcus at that oblique angle, you would be able to theoretically see all four valves in the same section. You see all this white stuff. So all this white stuff is the, quote, fibrous skeleton. We are in between the ventricles and the atria. And you see all those valves are being held in place by this fibrous skeleton. Which of those must be the bicuspid? You see where it gets its name? It almost looks like a bicuspid tooth, two points to it. So that is clearly the bicuspid. And this one is clearly the tricuspid. Now, that makes sense, right? I can, I can make sense of that. But look at these. Do those semilunars look like half a moon to you? I've never understood how those valves got their name. That does not look like half a moon, right? Semilunar, I'm looking for half a moon. I don't see half a moon. So I really don't, I, I've got to go back and figure out historically why in the world these valves got the name that they had. So of those three valves, the only one I could ever possibly ask you to identify because it jumps out at you is the bicuspid, right? The one with two points on it. Fair enough? And then all the white stuff around it is the fibrous skeleton that gives the heart its shape. It gives it its structure. Okay, boy, this is review. Four chambers, right and left atria, right and left ventricle, valves that keep things moving in one direction. This is basically the same series of slides that I presented to you in lab as I was presenting the square heart. So I'm not going to sit here and go through this step by step by step. If I get to something that makes no sense, please clarify. Raise your hand. Let me clarify. But you should be, I think, feeling comfortable with this flow of blood. So the right atrium. How did blood get there? Either the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, or the coronary sinus. There is a wall between the right and the left atrium that we would call the interatrial septum. What would we find in our hearts in the interatrial septum? Fossa ovalis, right? The fossa, the indentation, good. If this were a fetal heart, we would instead find the foramen ovale, right, in that, in that interatrial septum. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to travel down from the right atrium through the right atrioventricular valve, we know that's also called the tricuspid. We just saw a cartoon representation of it. The name makes sense. It has three parts to it. That one, thankfully, makes sense. Remember, this is all blue blood. Those valves are going to open when blood needs to go to the next place 
and then they're going to close, and as these valves close, they're going to assure that blood can't go backwards. Does anyone know what it's called when blood does flow backwards? Okay, a murmur. So a heart murmur literally is the blood flowing backwards. Now, people, when the doctor listens with the stethoscope to your heart, a murmur kind of sounds like a, almost like a rocking chair, like a squeaky rocking chair. It's a distinctive sound that people are trained to listen for. Now, a little bit of murmur is okay. People are born with it. Their valves are a little bit leaky. But if that murmur becomes really substantial, what does it tell us? That blood is not moving in the right direction. It is instead flowing backwards, which is completely against the whole idea. And so if the murmur becomes substantial enough, then there might need to be repair done to that valve. That I mean, open heart surgery procedure or even a valve replacement, which we're now doing. Once we're down in the right ventricle, right, again, we're still blue blood. There's that interventricular septum there. We got that idea. And here we also see the papillary muscles and those chordae tendini, which are attached to them. Are we picturing this okay? Now, from the right ventricle, I'm going to leave and go into the pulmonary trunk. How did I get there? And I'm going to cross off a couple things for you. We did not talk about the conus, so you can cross that off. And to get into the pulmonary trunk, I had to pass through what? Pulmonary. The pulmonary semilunar, or just the pulmonary valve. Some doctors, the pulmonic valve. Same thing. Okay, now we're in the pulmonary trunk. Now, the pulmonary trunk is going to do what? Split right and left pulmonary arteries heading off to the blood, bringing, quote, blue blood. Now, that pulmonary artery is a semi-lunar valve. And, again, I don't see the half moon. Um, they really are three little pieces. And these valves, this is important to appreciate, these valves are not like cuckoo clocks, meaning they don't open and close on some timer. Okay? These are not, these are not cuckoo clocks, these valves. Instead, these valves only open when they're pushed, like saloon doors. So they, they open when you push on them. The pushing is from the pressure caused by the contraction of the vessel, of, of, the, of the chamber. So these things, like I said, they're not cuckoo clocks. They're not just opening and closing 75 times a minute, right? They are only opening because they're being pushed with sufficient pressure. So if the heart can't squeeze hard enough, that means blood cannot move and the valves can't be pushed open. And that'll make, uh, be more understood in a few minutes. So let's take a look. Again, I'm going to do the old uh, uh, pin the, pin the uh, heart with some colored dots, and you tell me what I'm looking at. That valve. Pulmonary valve. Does everyone agree? That valve. You just kind of drew over it. Aortic valve. This valve. Bicuspid. And finally, yeah, you find more colors. And finally, tricuspid. Now, what did I tell you? That theoretically, you could potentially draw one line through the heart and catch all four of those valves in the same plane because they're all embedded in that fibrous skeleton. Um, I see here a very thick layer of muscle, so I know I'm in what chamber? Left ventricle. Again, that's the apex. If I took a scalpel and poked it at the left, at the apex, I'd be in the left ventricle. What do I see here? I feel like uh, some magic eye thing, romper room thing. Um, there's no name for this. There's a little opening right there. I don't have a name for it, but what was that little eraser-shaped opening in the right atrium? That was the opening for the blood return from the coronary sinus. Okay, no name for it that I know of. I'm sure there is, but that's the opening for the coronary sinus. Versus what is this thing? That indentation is the. That's the, 
Basa ovalis. Okay, good. I also want you to see one more thing. This may help pull some things together. One, two, three papillary muscles. Because that is the tricuspid. Whereas on the other side, one, two papillary muscles, bicuspid. Okay. I think we've about killed that pretty well. There's the actual thing. When you see the heart in a couple of weeks in the dissection, you will, I think, be quite impressed by just how thick that left ventricular wall is and how wimpy the right side is. And having the wall that's taken out as much space, it's still is Well, that's just it. The question is, boy, how is it that that's such a thick wall on the left ventricle? Well, what does a smaller space increase? Pressure. Pressure, exactly. So that's exactly, it's all part of the design. So not only is it squeezing harder because of more muscle, but because there is a smaller space, it increases the pressure. Perfect. Okay, the left atrium, we know we've just brought blood back from the lungs. We're bringing red blood in. There are about four pulmonary veins, two coming in from the left, two coming in from the right. And underneath, or in the atria, if you look on the underside of the auricle, you will see pectinate muscles. And so the ventricle has papillary muscles and the atria have pectinate muscles. And they're just kind of a cool structure that you'll see when you do the dissections. We pass down through the left atrioventricular valve. You know this is the bicuspid or the mitral. We still see those chordae tendini. We still see, uh, on this side, red blood. We're now down the left ventricle, thickest, largest of the chambers, tremendous squeezer, lots of pressure. And to leave the left ventricle, where am I going to head? Ah, you can also cross off the trabeculae, because that was something we could cross off in lab, isn't it? So don't worry about that. We see those large papillary muscles, two of them, right? Two very large ones attached because the valve on that side only has two parts, right? Bicuspid. We then see that the blood is going to be pushed up and out the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. In this rendition of the heart, what do we, what do you, what jumps out of you first in this picture? Am I hearing mumble about the thickness, right? So that thickness of the left side, very prominent, and a much wimpier right side. Can't miss it. You really can't. Everything I've just said is just recapped in this little table on the heart valves. So, tricuspid, pulmonary semilunar, bicuspid, aortic semilunar. It just simply reminds you where in the heart it is. That's it. Okay, there's nothing really, there's nothing new on here, but if you like tables and you like looking at all the information in one place, you might want to pull that table up. I know that these tables are too small to read, pretty much on your PowerPoints, so this is a reminder to occasionally just pull up your PowerPoints on Blackboard, take a look at them full screen. Your eyes won't get so tired, you'll see things better. Now, at the end of the lab period, when I'd gone through the square heart, I had shown you this same slide. And again, if you don't like square heart, that's fine. But you need to know this flow of blood like the back of your hand. So you need to know this. So again, take a look at this. Reminder that everything on the top is blue and everything on the bottom is pink or red as you study through this. Is that feeling good? I mean, is the whole blood through the heart feeling pretty strong? I hope so. We had a quiz on it. It went reasonably well for most folks. Now, this is brand new. But what, we're, what I'm going to use from this, I'm going to talk about the cardiac cycle. And as I talk about the cardiac cycle, it's going to require you to kind of pull all that I've said so far together. So the heart beats about 75 times a minute. There's a time of contraction followed by a time of relaxation. And that time from as it squeezes and relaxes, each of those cycles is referred to as the cardiac cycle. So we have alternating contraction and relaxation. The contraction phase is referred to as systole. 
or the systolic pressure. And then the relaxation phase is the diastole, the diastolic pressure. Remember from our vocab, diastole meant uh, stand apart or relax, and systole to contract. What we're referring here is the myocardium, right? The muscle is contracting. Typically, when someone just says systolic, they're referring to your ventricles. If nothing else is said, they're referring to your ventricles. Why are they referring to the ventricles? The ventricles are really the workhorse, right? So if I just say your systolic pressure, we're usually referring to the squeezing of the ventricles. Yes, the atria squeeze. And yes, you could call that atrial systole. And I will use that word. But if it doesn't say atrial, assume ventricular. So we're always talking about the squeezing of the muscular chambers. On this image, you only have to deal with half of this. And, and this is really important to me and I think, well, and, and it should be to you as well. We'll deal with this in much greater detail next semester. For now, go ahead and put a nice little X through this side of the image. I only want you to deal with the left-hand side of the image. Let's take a look, and I know this is hard to see. What it's saying at the very, very top, atrial systole. That is, the atria are contracting. So tell me what's going on. When the atria are contracting, well, the atria are contracting, right? That's what it says. The ventricles at that same time are relaxing. If the atria are contracting, they're pushing, they're squeezing, blood is going to go pushed through what valve? If the left and the right atria are squeezing at the same time, they're going to be squeezing and pushing blood through what valves? Bicuspid and tricuspid, otherwise known as the AV valves. So the AV valves would be pushed open by the squeezing of the atria. When the AV valves are squeezing, the semilunar valves are going to be closed. Okay? So that's why I want you to see that little column. And then over here, the second column, this is where the ventricles are squeezing. This is ventricular systole. Let's think about it. When the ventricles are squeezing, the atria are instead relaxing. When the ventricles are squeezing, what chamber or what, what valves are being pushed open? Semilunars. So the semilunars are open, but the AV valves are closed. Now, why is it so important that those AV valves be held closed? Yeah, let's think about this, right? You got to kind of put your your get the little video camera going in your head. As the ventricles are squeezing under a lot of pressure, you want the blood only to go up and out through the semilunar valves. You wouldn't want the blood to go back up into the atria. So those papillary muscles, let's picture this. As the ventricles squeeze, it's also pulling on the papillary muscles. As the papillary muscles pull, they're pulling on the chordae tendineae. And the chordae tendineae are now doing what? Slamming shut those AV valves. So you want those AV valves tight. You want them not to leak so that all the blood can forcefully go up into the aorta and into the pulmonary trunk. Okay, make sense? This table, just that half. Don't worry about the other half. Don't worry about the right side. Just worry about what's happening to the chambers and the valves during atrial systole and ventricular systole. That's it. Okay, so cross off this right-hand side of this image. I'm going to wait for just a second. Is there anything in there that, that I need to say again? Let me, just, let me just say it and ask you. When the atria are squeezing, atrial systole, what valves are being pushed open? AVs, right, the AV valves. When the ventricles are squeezing, what valves are being pushed open? 
semilunars. And whenever one valve is open, the other one is closed. Whenever one chamber is squeezing, the other one is relaxing. We'll keep it there. Right? That's very simplistic, but that's, that'll get us through 105 cardio, cardiac cycle. That's what I need you to understand. There's more to it. Right? Cardiologists spend a few years figuring this out. But that's enough for now. Now, what is it that tells the heart to contract? Have you ever watched any of those TLC shows and there's a heart transplant and the patient has been declared brain dead? And in fact, they've got the heart outside of the person's body and the heart is still pumping. The heart is autorhythmic. It has what we call autorhythmicity. Basically what it means is that you can disconnect the brain from the heart and the heart will keep on going. As long as there's energy, as long as there's ATP. But the heart will keep on beating. And the reason is the heart has within it its own impulse. We call this the pacemaker, right? It, it, it makes the pacing of the heart. Your heart has a natural pacemaker. This is referred to as the conduction system. This is what's going to jumpstart your heart 75 times a minute. So you have this pacemaker and the heart will keep on beating. What does the sympathetic nervous system do to the rate of that contract, or to the rate of that beating? If you're being chased by the bear, the rate goes up. If you're resting and digesting parasympathetic, the rate goes down. But your brain is not initiating your heart rate. The, brain, the heart does that on its own. So the initiation of the heartbeat is coming from the heart itself modulating up and down, right? Changing the rate of a heart rate is part of the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. The heart is innervated by the coronary plexus. All that means is a group of nerves that go to the heart. Coronary plexus. Name one of those nerves, please. What nerve? do we know goes to the heart and to the stomach and to the lungs and right the vagus nerve right so whew, right over the top right so the vagus nerve is part of that coronary plexus it's part of the nerves that do travel to the heart and I just said when you're being chased by the bear right the vagus sends a signal telling the heart to rate to go up when you're resting and digesting by the campfire the parasympathetic system goes down and tells the heart to kind of cool it, right? Relax a little bit. Never shut, uh, you can't shut off, right? You can't turn it off, but just slow down the heart rate. So again, innervation uh, does not initiate, but or the autonomic system does not initiate, but does increase or decrease the heart rate. You know what? I'm not gonna have you name this semester the individual coronary arteries. And I didn't do this in lab either, right? In the lab, we crossed off all those individual names. Um, you just know that there is a right and a left coronary artery. It is true that the right coronary artery does typically branch, and you may hear these words in the future, and I will have you learn them in 106, but there's a marginal and the superior interventricular artery. It's not tough, right? Where does it must go? Right? On, the, on the back side in between the ventricles, right? But we're not going to name those. So don't worry about the individual names. Same way is true with the left side. The left side also splits into the circumflex. Uh, so we won't worry about that. If you took a angiogram, an angiogram would be a picture right, of the angios, of the vessels of the heart you would notice that my series of arteries is vastly different from your series of arteries. Yes, they still have the right and the left, and they still have the marginal and the circumflex, but they're all slightly different. It's almost like each person's heart system is almost like they're an individual fingerprint. It really is kind of random, although every part of the heart will receive the blood that it needs. So here's just a cartoon representation of the arteries. What do we see here? The arteries are coming off the aorta as soon as the blood comes up into the aortic arch, doesn't it? 
So the freshest, most oxygenated blood is going to leave out of the left ventricle, come up into the aortic arch, and immediately spread to the heart muscle. And we see that right and left coronary arteries, and then we see all those coronary arteries that we're not going to individually name. And then what happens with that blood, folks? Delivers oxygen, nutrients, and then comes back through a series of cardiac veins. And what do we see? All those cardiac veins are doing what? Leading toward, oops, all those cardiac veins are leading, they're all heading back toward, sorry, I'm having technical problems here. They're all leading back toward what? Coronary. coronary sinus. And then look at that little, that picture even has it. The coronary sinus has a little drain hole, and that's draining back into the right atrium. Yes? Story is complete now. So what in the world is a heart attack? And what is angina? Here's our clinical. If there's going to be a case study in this test, you better believe someone's going to need a blood transfusion. You better know your blood typing. And somebody's going to have a heart attack or describe something about a heart attack. You can anticipate that, right, in a case study kind of question. So angina or angina, you'll hear it pronounced both ways, versus an MI, a heart attack. Who ever heard of angina or angina? It's not very commonly described very much anymore because if a person goes into the hospital and they have angina, they're going to fix it. Now, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, angina was basically the signs that you're going to have a heart attack in the next couple years. So what angina is, is a blockage, a partial blockage of a coronary artery. And people who have angina would typically carry around a little vial of pills called nitroglycerin. And that nitro is a pill they'd pop under the tongue. And that nitro is a very potent vasodilator. So what would happen? It opens up their vessels. It allows the blood to get through that partially blocked vessel. They would feel that they had to take that nitroglycerin pill because they were having chest pain. So maybe they're out shoveling snow or they're doing something that they, a little bit more exertion than they're normally used to, and they feel this pain, they pop a pill, life is good. Okay, they have angina. Um, it means that your coronary arteries are being slowly blocked, but not completely. If there is a complete and sudden block of a coronary artery, now you have an art a heart attack. Okay. And this can be, you can have a heart attack without ever having any signs beforehand. So it doesn't mean that you had to have had an angina leading up to a heart attack, but that would have been a natural progression. So angina, it says here, is a localized, poorly localized pain, usually along the left, um, usually resulting after some sort of strenuous activity, something beyond the person's normal activity range. Whereas an MI is a sudden and complete blockage of a coronary artery. As a result, the heart is dying. That portion of the heart, as I showed you before, is dying. It's not receiving oxygen, and that heart does not regenerate. So that's the problem. And I've already told you, right, it kind of gave you the idea. The more proximal the blockage, the more damage that occurs. The more distal the blockage, the further down it is, the better the outcome because less of the heart will have been damaged. Hmm. We're back to this. You should be able to, with great confidence, take your finger and flow through this. There's images similar to this in your textbook. Please make sure you can know the flow of blood through the heart, that you know right and left, that you know red and blue, that you understand pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. We've been through it now in lab. You've been quizzed on it. I've gone through it with you very carefully and slowly today. Your work now is just to confirm that you get it. On the test, you will definitely be asked questions about your understanding of this. If on the test you're still kind of developing this idea and you haven't quite got the movie playing on autopilot yet, turn your test over and draw out the square heart. Turn the test over and draw out a flow chart. But don't, right, don't come into this test without your ability to, to walk through this. It'll be far better if you can do this comfortably. 
And that does bring us rather quickly, right, to the end of that chapter. And we do that rather fast. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go back. We're going to take a few minutes break. And I'm going to go back and do some highlights through the blood chapter. I know I told you to do it on your own. But I've got time around now to hit you some, hit some highlights. And that will still leave us all of next Monday to hit the blood vessel chapter, which also won't take the entire time. So I feel good about our timing on this. So let's take about a five-minute break. We'll come back, and we'll do 20 minutes of blood. And I'll hit some highlights on that. And then next week, that will leave us just with um, blood vessels to finish up the content for this next test. So it doesn't look so overwhelming now, does it? It's really three rather short presentations on this next test. So I have some time. I have some time that I wasn't sure I was going to have. So I want to go back to the blood chapter. Now, I had asked you to go ahead and look at this on your own. But let me just jump through. And I'm, I've only got 15 minutes here. But what I want to do is jump just to the slides that are brand new. And the things that I have discussed in lab, I will kind of jump over. So if I jump over, it doesn't mean it's not important. It just means you've already seen it and should already be good about it. And let me just get through some main ideas. OK, now we've seen this slide before. We know that blood's a connective tissue. I told you that it's warmer than our body and that we can separate the blood. We can take the blood, put it into a centrifuge tube, and spin it. You'll be doing that in 106. You'll actually take some blood, put it in a centrifuge tube, spin it down. And when we do that, we get the levels or the layers of blood. And there are three major components in blood. One are the red blood cells. Those are the erythrocytes. Then there's a middle layer called the buffy coat. That's where, after you centrifuge, you'll see the white blood cells and the platelets. And then finally, on the very top, is the plasma. And the plasma is the liquidy portion of your blood. So went through this lab. I went through this slide in lab, I know. Remember, we take blood normally from a vein. Phleb, meaning vein, phlebotomist. We take that blood and put it into the tube. We take venous blood because it's more easy to get to. It is under less pressure, uh, all those reasons. And we put it in the centrifuge. We spin for five minutes. And when we're all done, this is what we get. And we'll see that the red blood cells are on the bottom, that the buffy coat is this very thin layer right in the very, very center. And then on the top is the liquidy plasma. What do we actually have in that is pretty amazing. In this lower fraction, again, you've seen this slide, in the lower fraction, four to six million red blood cells per cubic millimeter. And a cubic millimeter, remember, a cubic millimeter is the same as one microliter, one millionth of a liter. So a very, very small drop of blood has four to six million red blood cells in it. Relative numbers. Okay, so four to six million, yeah, five million, something in the millions, right? Okay, just to get a, 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 an idea of this. Now, in this buffy coat, in that little thin layer, there you're going to have white blood cells. Look at their numbers, only five to 10,000 per microliter. So millions versus thousands. And then also in that buffy coat are the platelets. They're going to run in the hundreds of thousands, like 100,000, 200,000, somewhere around there. Okay. Then up in the plasma, what is it? It's water. It's mostly water. But in addition to water, it's also some proteins. And as I go through this, I'm going to go, go through each of these proteins and what each protein is doing in the blood. And then also in the plasma would be the gases and the waste products and the nutrients and the hormones and whatever it else, clotting factors, whatever else is floating through and dissolved in your blood is dissolved in that plasma. If you go to the bank, the blood bank, you're going to give whole blood. And whole blood is basically plasma plus formed elements. Now, formed elements is an important word. In your blood, you've got red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. Platelets are not true cells, okay? So to call them the blood cells is a little bit of a, mis a misnomer. And so they call all of these things the formed elements. That refers to the red cells and the white cells and the platelets. Do you remember my saying in the first or second lecture that red blood cells 
don't have a nucleus. Red blood cells can't divide. Red blood, red blood cells do not have the ability of making more of themselves. So from the first lecture when I talked about the characteristics of life, and I said that all living things reproduce, red blood cells can't reproduce. They don't have a nucleus. Therefore, you could argue that red blood cells are not even cells. So for that reason, we call these things formed elements. What are the functions of blood? I think this is pretty obvious. Erythrocytes, their job, carry oxygen. That's their job, right? They carry oxygen. They also pick up some CO2. So they're carrying the gases. Whereas, what else is happening? What else is being transported? Also being transported through your blood are nutrients, right? Glucose and sugar molecules are being transported. Hormones are also being transported throughout your body by the blood. And waste products are also being carried back to, um, to your heart and to your lungs and your kidneys, right, to get rid of those waste products. Another important function of the blood is the regulation of your body temperature. We know this. Uh, why is it a little bit cooler in Muskegon than Grand Rapids in the winter? Or sorry, in the summer. A little bit cooler over here because of the lake. And also in the, in the summertime, sorry, the wintertime, where am I? In the, in the wintertime, it's a little bit warmer over here. Again, because the lake does what? Holds heat and holds, holds temperature. So the same thing is true in your body. Um, your body maintains its body temperature in part because it's fluid, this blood that's a lot of water that's transporting through your body. So when you're hot, what happens? You're exercising, you're warm, you sweat, and you become more red in color because those blood vessels open up toward the surface of your dermis. You look more red, you're sweating, you're letting off heat. When it's cold out, we look more pale. Blood vessels go deeper. We have, don't have the blood at the surface, and our body is trying to conserve heat. So we know that blood helps regulate our body temperature. This is the big one, pH. Back in lab two, we talked a little bit about pH. And recall, if you will, that blood, remember pH, it was from 0 to 14? Mm -hmm. And things below 7 were considered acidic, and things above 7 were considered alkaline or basic. 7, right in the middle, was water neutral. And recall also that blood pH, I told you at that point, was 7.4. That's the number you got to keep in the, in, the, in the rotary deck, right? So 7.4 is the average pH of your blood. And the body can't tolerate it being much different from that. It's very tightly regulated. As we go through the rest of this course, we're going to see how the kidneys and how the lungs help keep that blood pH at 7.4. Okay, it's very, very important. So the blood is helping to maintain that. We'll just stop there and keep going. Uh, number four, I think it is, blood is helping to maintain your body's fluid levels. If you have too much fluid accumulating in your tissues, you would complain of edema, swelling. If you had too much fluid in your blood vessels, your doctor would say you have hypertension, right? The pressure of the blood is too high. So there's a very tightly regulated norm of how much fluid is in your cells, how much fluid is in between your cells, how much fluid is in your blood. Too much pressure, again, high blood pressure, too little pressure, you would complain about edema. To, uh, but to really understand this, you need to go back to lab two in your head, and that's where we learned that solutes suck. Just remember that for a minute. And in your blood, there are proteins. Those proteins are the solute molecules. And if there isn't enough solute in your blood, that means that the blood can't suck the water in, and that means there would be too much water out in your tissues. Remember that in a few minutes when I talk about the proteins in your blood. Blood is also incredibly protective you are transporting white blood cells. White blood cells are part of your immune system. They're protecting you 
Remember some of your white blood cells that make the antibodies that we've been talking about in lab related to blood typing. Also, platelets are protective in that they're going to help you stop from bleeding out. So if you cut yourself, the platelets are going to help you with your blood clotting. So we have a lot of protection going on by your blood. Now, what is in blood? We've already mentioned this a little bit. It is water. Oh, sorry, plasma. What is plasma? Plasma is mostly water, but there are some proteins mixed in there and other things as well. If you take the proteins out of the plasma, you're left with what's referred to as serum. So if you hear the word serum, basically you've let the blood clot and you've taken the proteins out, and what's left behind is, quote, the serum. Most of your blood is water, right? 92% of your plasma is water. That means that everything that's transporting through your blood is somehow dissolved in that water. That means that those molecules are what? Hydrophilic, right? So hydrophilic things will easily travel through the blood. Hydrophobic things would not, or they would have to be transported in a different way. So what are these proteins? I think I'll get, I'll get through this today. You know what? I'm pretty confident. We're going to be able to finish blood on uh, Monday. Okay, I'll be able to kind of walk right through this and then even get through the blood vessels. I feel really quite confident on that. Um, but if you want to work ahead, I will skip over some things. So if you want to listen ahead to this blood lecture, I would suggest it because I will be jumping over some things. But I think I'll have time on Wednesday to, or on Monday to, to highlight some of this as well. So within your plasma, there are proteins, four different types. They account for about 7% of the volume of your plasma. The proteins include albumins, globulins, fibrinogen, and a garbage pail of everything else, just called regulatory proteins. So let me go through each of these and what they're doing, and then we'll finish up. We'll finish up with proteins right now. So albumins. They are the smallest of your proteins in your blood, and they're the most abundant. So albumin's abundant. They account for about 60 or so percent of all of your proteins. Basically, albumin's egg white, right? It's really the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Egg whites and albumin, same thing. I told you that solutes suck. This protein does many things, but the thing I want you to think about right now is that it's regulating your water movement into and out of your blood. All of your blood proteins, I haven't said this yet, but all of your blood proteins are made in your liver. Okay, So the albumin is made in the liver. If a child or an adult does not have enough protein in their diet, and they cannot make proteins, right? They don't have enough albumins in their blood because their diet is also protein poor. This is the Save the Children commercial on TV. What do you see from those little kids who are starving? Pot, pot bellies. Skinny little arms, skinny little legs, but pot bellies. What's going on? They don't need any money. They got big old bellies. What's going on? Let's think about this. If you don't have enough protein coming into your body, therefore you don't have enough albumin in your blood. Saw so you'd suck. If you don't have enough albumin in your blood, that means that your blood will not suck as much water into it. Well, where is that water left? Outside of your blood vessels, accumulating in your abdominal pelvic cavity. So you'll have these big, big swollen abdominal area, right, as a sign that you just don't have enough protein. So this would also be a side effect of people with liver damage. A person who has liver damage, liver disease, hepatitis, will also have fluid accumulation on their gut. Same reason. Not because they're malnourished, but because their liver is not making the albumin sufficiently so that their body is left with not enough solutes, the fluid does not get sucked into their bloodstream, is left outside between their, their tissues, leading to edema. The second most abundant group are the albumin. Oh, sorry, not the albumin. The second most abundant group are the globulins. 
you've already introduced this group. These are also called your immunoglobulins, or more commonly, your antibodies. So the second most abundant group of proteins traveling through your blood are the antibodies. They are the fight, right? They're fighting off foreign things. Anything that enters your body that is foreign is going to be hopefully attacked by and destroyed by your immune system. Number three, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen accounts for about 4% of all of your proteins and is hugely important in blood clotting. Here's the story on fibrinogen. It is floating in your blood all the time. If, however, or when I should say, a blood vessel is damaged, you cut it, something has gone wrong, you've damaged the blood vessel. At that moment, that fibrinogen will be changed into fibrin. So let me draw this out, it's more of a visual. So fibrinogen is the protein, it's floating in your blood all the time. When you cut yourself, fibrinogen is cut to become fibrin. Fibrin is insoluble, okay? So what does that mean? Fibrin comes out of solution and helps to create your blood clot. Fibrinogen is soluble, it's dissolved, right? It's there all the time, it's dissolved in your blood, but when you cut yourself, fibrinogen becomes solu or insoluble fibrin. Okay, and that becomes a very important part of your blood clot. And then finally, the last protein group are these regulatory proteins. These are your clotting factors, other enzymes, hormones, everything else that's floating in your blood is kind of thrown into this garbage pail called the regulatory proteins. So we'll stop there on blood. And yeah, we'll be okay. So I'll go through the highlights of this. Um, but keep in mind, we've only got one week before our test. It's going to be a busy, right, one more lecture, and that's it. So please do not take too much of a vacation this weekend. I would definitely be on mastering. I would definitely be looking at my chapter on the heart. Check, you can do that one. I'd be looking at my, check, my chapter on blood. Try it. Go back and finish what you don't understand next week. And you might even want to check out your blood vessel chapter because you have seen some of that in lab. Short paper is due. When? Not next week. Next week? Yes. Same day as the test? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And the take home test? Take home test is done no. by Monday. That's due Monday. Right, Thank right. you. So the take home, so, so yeah, no slacking because you have a take home test and a short paper. Okay, that, we'll was a, that was my message. That was my message. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs>